women only have a certain number of eggs. They're born with all of them. And uh, over time, the numbers of eggs get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, what we've been doing at CHR is trying to maximize the use of remaining eggs in women who have already begun to deplete their, their ovarian reserves. And we've done that in a variety of ways by changing the medications we use and uh, in the last few years um, using an androgen called DHEA, which we believe helps to maximize the use of, of those early follicles that are going to be um, the, the raw material that uh, the woman brings into her cycle when she goes through a normal cycle. Normally a woman produces one egg in her, in her menstrual cycle. We of course use fertility medications to help her produce more eggs in her menstrual cycle, but a woman with diminished ovarian reserve doesn't have as much of that raw material, the small follicles that she needs to bring into that ovulation induction cycle so she can produce more eggs. It's as though, um, as though you had um, in the fall planted one or two um, tulip bulbs. It doesn't matter how much you water them, you're only going to get two tulip bulb, two, two flowers uh, in the springtime. So no matter how much fertility medication we give somebody, if she comes into the cycle with a very small amount of small follicles, which I was calling the raw material before, in which we more formally call the functional ovarian reserve, she's not going to be able to produce a lot of eggs. We've been able to use DHEA in many cases to improve that functional ovarian reserve. Basically, it's taking the small follicles that are already there, preserving them in a more efficient way so they can be available when you start the normal ovulation induction. But DHEA doesn't work for everybody. Uh, and there are some cases in which in spite of using DHA, in spite of using maximal fertility medications, um, we aren't able to get a sufficient number of eggs in order to help a woman uh, achieve her pregnancy goals. Um, and uh, for many years, um, Dr. Gleischer and I have been thinking about using human growth hormone for this purpose. Uh, the basis for this goes back to several things, but for us, um, it really became apparent when we started, when we first started looking at DHEA, one of the things that early papers looking at DHEA found was that DHEA, in, in addition to increasing the number of follicles that were there, in addition to improving the estrogen response to ovulation induction, increased something known as IGF-1. Now IGF-1 is the active um, end product of growth hormone. It's what, what growth hormone becomes when it acts on, 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 the, on its end organs. And so uh, even that suggested that there may be some relationship in the way that our androgens are working and the way that uh, growth hormone might be working. Now others have looked at growth hormone for treating women with poor ovarian reserve uh, in the past. And in fact, there was a recent um, Cochrane review uh, that uh, looked at uh, the whole history of use of human growth hormone in, uh, in women with uh, poor ovarian function, actually women with normal ovarian function as well. And uh, after looking at several previously published randomized controlled trials, uh, the Cochrane Review concluded that in cases of women with diminished ovarian reserve, um, there's sufficient evidence to think that using growth hormone may indeed uh, improve pregnancy rates. But it didn't improve it a lot and the results weren't entirely consistent. Um, now, based on our experience in uh, the way we've been using DHEA and trying to maximize that raw material, that functional ovarian reserve, um, we believe that if we give growth hormone 
for that extended period of time, similar to the way we give the DHEA, that we're going to see a better response than they did in the past. All the previous studies looking at human growth hormone were only giving it at the very beginning of the fertility medications. Um, some of them gave it for maybe a week or 10 days before. Uh, we believe that that's not sufficient to see the maximal effect because the, the, the time where we normally give fertility medications is only a fraction of the time of the life of the follicle. And our goal is to try to maximize the health of that early egg as it's developing. And the majority of that egg's development is occurring uh, for weeks uh, before it ever gets to that ovulation induction cycle. So we feel um, that um, you can't fix something that's already broken. What we'd like to do is make it strong to begin with. Now we know that these early antral follicles have uh, receptors uh, for human growth hormone. We know that, that they, they have potential of responding to it. And um, we, we, we're, we're, we're hoping with this trial, or this very exciting trial, uh, to be able to, at least in a preliminary way, um, show uh, that by using the same strategy that we've used for DHEA, that we can maximize um, the, a woman's use of her uh, functional ovarian reserve, improving her functional ovarian reserve um, by starting uh, this treatment back uh, about six to eight weeks before. In the trial, we're going to use six weeks. At CHR, we've had good experience uh, in uh, treating people with our existing protocols using DHEA and, and, and maximal ovulation induction. Um, we're looking at this point in the human growth hormone for women who have failed those procedures. And in this initial trial, um, we're really looking to see if we can help the women who are in the greatest amount of trouble and, and need the most help. So we're not looking to, to apply this um, to the average woman that's coming here. In fact, we're reserving uh, participation in this clinical trial to women who have failed to produce uh, eggs in, in our normal treatment strategy. So we're asking that the women be, in this clinical trial, be uh, less than 45 years old, that they've previously failed to produce uh, more than two eggs uh, in a previous uh, attempt at ovulation induction using our DHEA protocols uh, that we normally apply to them with this sort of problem. Uh, and that's, that's really the criteria. So it'll be a very select group of women who have um, failed what we think of as our normal approach to this problem. Basically, uh, we're going to look to see what their response is to the ovulation induction, meaning how many follicles they produce, um, what uh, their level of um, hormone response is to the, to, the, to the treatment. But the real outcome measure of the trial is going to be how many healthy eggs and embryos are produced, because that's the thing we're trying to correct. So. Um, our expectation is that women who have a history of only producing uh, two or fewer eggs um, will produce more uh, after this treatment and um, we need to show that uh, the women who are being treated with the active hormone are producing a statistically significant uh, larger number of eggs compared to those who would be in the control group. Because human growth hormone um, is so expensive, uh, because it's currently, uh, this is currently an off-label use, meaning it's not approved by the FDA for this kind of purpose, um, and because there's very little data out there to fully support that, that it's actually effective, um, we feel that we need to do the trial first uh, to show that it, 
is an effective treatment before we start offering it uh, to everybody. Uh, women who have been through a cycle here at CHR on maximal treatment, who have produced fewer than two eggs if they're under the age of 45 years old, will be invited uh, to participate in the trial. Um, the first step in any clinical trial is for people to understand that uh, the clinical trial requires randomization uh, into either, either active treatment or control. And essentially it's like flipping a coin. And the reason that we're willing to flip a coin in this case is because at this moment we are in a state of what we call equipoise, meaning we don't have data to say that one way is better than the other. And so the only way to test if one way is better than the other is to enter some sort of randomness to this uh, so at the end of the trial, we can see if in fact one performs better than the other. Uh, it's necessary that our patients be in that state of undecision too. Obviously, if we thought one was better, we wouldn't be doing the trial. And so we just don't know which is better yet. So the first step in this process is for people to agree to be randomized and to have a conversation with us to understand what the nature of a clinical trial is. So the treatment will be just under two milligrams uh, a day of human growth hormone. Now this is recombinant human growth hormone, meaning it's being manufact manufactured um, synthetically uh, in a laboratory. Uh, in the past, uh, people used growth hormone that was actually taken from human pituitaries but there was some fear of um, infectious diseases being transferred that way, so there is no uh, human-derived human growth hormone uh, uh, available on the market anymore. This is all um, synthetic. It's the same molecule, but it's not coming from an actual uh, person. In the past, they took it from cadavers. Um, uh, and uh, the group that's not randomized to active treatment will just be using our standard therapy. So there'll be no placebo or sham injection. As a result, this is not a blinded randomized clinical trial. Um, this is an open label clinical trial. So the people who are using growth hormone will know that they're using it. The people who are not using growth hormone will know that they're not using it. And of course, they'll have the option of using it sometime in the future um, after the, their um, cycle and the trial is over if they choose to. Um, growth hormone is one of the most expensive medications out there on the market. Um, it's um, expensive probably because it's only used and approved for a very restricted um, population, namely children who have short stature and a few other rare uh, adult diseases. Um, so there's not a large market out there for it, so the pharmaceutical companies that produce this medication pass that cost on to the consumer. Uh, one week of human growth hormone probably costs in the neighborhood of $750 to $800 um, a week. Uh, thus, over um, six weeks, uh, the costs will be substantial, or actually over eight weeks. It'll be eight times six, which is about $5,000. Any medication has uh, some side effects. Um, growth hormone uh, has been reported, in, when used in adults, to cause some swelling. So there can be significant swelling of uh, ankles, wrists, uh, and uh, I'm not exactly clear why this is true, um, but the fear is that it could have to do with, um, cardi to some extent, with cardiac function. And so we have decided not to randomize anybody into the trial who has a history of any cardiac disease. In addition, growth hormone is something that um, uh, changes one's tolerance to sugar and so anybody who has um, a glucose intolerance 
uh, or any overt diabetes uh, would also be excluded from the trial. Essentially, um, the patient group that we've identified as being candidates for this trial are people who, at present, we really don't have anything else to offer. Um, and so the only direction that they could go uh, if, if they want to continue to try to have a child uh, would be in the direction of using donor egg, which is entirely acceptable, except some people would prefer to have a child uh, using their own eggs. And uh, in, in looking for another direction uh, to take people to try to help them, um, this is the next intervention that we think has the greatest promise. We, we think that uh, it's possible that, um, that the combined effects of uh, treatment with DHEA and growth hormone may be greater than either one alone. Uh, and so uh, our patients in this trial will be continuing to use their DHEA and the other standard treatments that we use with the growth hormone sort of being an additional push. Uh, and we're hopeful that we can help um, this really um, most affected um, population of, of patients.